Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. A very big welcome to you all. Whether you are a visitor, a regular, or a member, it is good to have you here with us today to gather in the house of the Lord to praise the Alpha and Omega, the one who was, is, and always will be. Ndia nebulisa, nonke ke gama, lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. Ek grutele elk in the nom van ons Jere Jesus Christus. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us turn to each other, welcome each other, and greet each other with the peace of Christ. While we stand, we're going to sing a hymn of adoration and approach as the deer pants. to worship this morning is adapted from Psalm 145. The Lord upholds all those who fall. The Lord is gracious, gracious and compassionate. The Lord is good to all. We come to sing of your might. We come to worship, we come to praise, we come to sit in the presence of the Lord, our Lord who upholds us and lifts us up, our Lord who is filled with grace and compassion, our Lord who is slow to anger, almighty and glorious. He is the one we've come to meet today. So let us approach our living Lord in adoration and thanksgiving as we come to encounter him in silent and individual prayer. Let us pray. (coughs) 
Lord God, our friend, King and Redeemer, we come to seek you. We come to open our hearts and minds to you. We come because we yearn for you. We long to sit in your presence. You know, Lord, every step we took this past week. You know the moments we dreaded, the moments where we were unsure, the moments that we waited upon expectantly. And every moment, whether mad, sad or glad, you were there, going before us and beside us, constantly present. Thank you, Lord, that we know you are always available, approachable and active in our lives. You know us inside out and upside down, and so you also know the parts of us, those actions that we try and hide away. You know, Lord, those moments we act in jealousy, those moments we act out of greed and selfishness, moments we are rude and intolerable, moments we make it difficult for others to love us, moments we abuse the goodness of others, moments we are filled with pride, and those times where our words and our actions, our body language and our attitudes, and our facial expressions cause conflict, hurt, and pain to those around us. Lord, you know where and what we did and said this past week that did not correlate to your will. You know where we think got things wrong and walked off the path. Come and show us, Lord, where we went wrong, those moments that we are unaware of. Open our eyes to our actions and come and hear our silent and individual confessions. You are the God of grace and forgiveness, the God of second chances, the God that takes our sins and throws it into the deepest oceans never to think of it again, because you love us. We are sorry, Lord. Sorry that we so often get things wrong. You've heard our individual confessions. You've searched our hearts and examined our innermost being. You know whether we are sincere. If our confessions are acceptable in your sight, please, Lord, forgive us. Let your grace and forgiveness flow over us and through us as you cleanse us, restore us, pardon us and redeem us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us yet again. We sit here this morning in this building, surrounded by others who love you, as we come together as sinners, trying to do your good will. Come and meet us. Come and speak to us. Come and enfold us in your holy, mighty and awesome presence. Open our eyes, ears and beings to you, Lord, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Let us sing and stand and sing the hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
The lectionary reading for this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. And Marge O'Reilly will read that for us today. Good morning, everybody. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forethought sorry, forefathers, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds <clears throat> and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Here ends our reading this morning. May God's will be done. Thank you. If you take a moment to think about your life, what? was the longest journey that you have undertaken, whether by plane, car, or foot. Perhaps a trip overseas, or a drive to a neighboring country or province, or perhaps a hike that lasted a couple of days. Thinking back on your long journey, what do you remember most? Perhaps you remember the weather, especially if the wind was blowing like last night, or getting lost or getting fearful or a sad moment, or a happy moment or an exciting moment. Perhaps you remember the places you saw or the new experiences you had, the food you ate, or simply the people that were with you on the journey. As we page to the book of Jeremiah, we find a prophet who has been on a journey of his own, a journey with God. And his journey was characterized by pain, despair, lamenting, and sadness. Jeremiah was born close to Jerusalem to a priestly family, but the family line was under God's judgment. Do you remember Eli? Right. Remember Eli had sons and the sons did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord? Okay. And then the Lord said to Eli, none of your descendants will reach old age. Something, is there a bell going off somewhere? Okay. Jeremiah was part of that family line. However, even though before he was born, God appointed him a prophet. And as a youngster, he was quite timid and shy and sensitive. But at the age of 17, he began to preach. And when he started out, he was very, very nervous. But God continued to reassure him. Jeremiah preached for 40 years. And during those 40 years, his life as a prophet was tough. He had to move to Jerusalem at some point because his own family tried to assassinate him. He was continually in the thick of Judah's politics, which at the time was very, very horrible. Because Jeremiah preached towards the end of the life of the two tribes in the south, before the Babylonian exile. And Jeremiah, in fact, told the king, we need to surrender to Babylon so that lives can be spared. But when he did that, all his people branded him as a traitor. And from that moment on, no one wanted anything to do with him. They didn't want to see him, hear him, or know him. And he was then forced into exile to Egypt, where Jews eventually kidnapped him, took him up the River Nile to where we think is Ethiopia today, and there he died alone. His name in Hebrew means to build up and to tear down, which basically summarized the message he proclaimed for 40 years. If you obey God, you will be built up. If you disobey God, you will be thrown down. 
most of Jeremiah's words and messages and prophecies were negative. They were filled with despair and warning and judgment. And all of this negativity took a toll on this prophet. Rembrandt made a painting of him that he called Jeremiah lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem. And it shows the prophet against a very dark background with his head in his hand. It's an image of abandoned hope. We know Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations, also a book filled with sadness. So it seems that this poor man was quite depressed in the ministry and throughout his, old li old, throughout his whole life. Yet, when we reach chapter 30 and 31, this very sad, mournful, lamenting tone of Jeremiah suddenly changes to comfort, hope and optimism. Suddenly, we find promises that are most welcome. And the part of those promises we find in the four verses that Marge read to us today. Now, these words were addressed to the people just after the exile. So, they had just suffered the most traumatic loss of their land, of the monarchy, and most importantly, of the temple. Everything was uncertain. The future looked bleak and bad and dark and cloudy and hopeless. But into this bleak, dark, bad, cloudy, hopeless reality and future, Jeremiah speaks of new possibilities, a new covenant, and a new way to relate to God. Now in the book of Jeremiah, the covenant is a very important theme and motive. And it's highlighted over and over and over again. Specifically what is highlighted is the fact that the people were breaking the covenant with God. But as we read these four verses from Jeremiah, we discover that God's not done with them. We read the days are coming, in other words, a future expectation that things are going to change. A new covenant is going to be established. But what does that mean for the old covenant? Is the old covenant suddenly null and void? No. Us as modern people, we tend to think that as soon as we get a new thing, the old thing no longer matters and we chuck it away. But in the Bible, we find lots of different covenants. The covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant God made with Noah, the covenant God made with Moses, the covenant God made with David, the covenant God made with the people. And every time a new covenant is made, the old one isn't nullified. It is simply built upon. Now the new covenant that God is going to establish is going to be different from the old one. But in what ways? Well, one of the most important things about the new covenant is that the people will not be able to break it. How does that work? The people were not able to keep the laws and the ordinances and the statutes and the words that God gave to them through the tablets, stone tablets, or through the leaders or the prophets or the kings. But God now offers something that is a miracle. God will take this law that was written on the stone and instead he's going to write it on the people's hearts, putting it within them, says verse 33. Doing this remedies the failure of the past covenant, of the previous one, of the older one, because now the relationship is more sustainable. God is part of every fiber of our being. And therefore, verse 34 says, we won't have to tell each other, know the Lord, because we will already know the Lord. But what does that mean, to know the Lord? Well, it doesn't mean intellectual knowledge. Knowing someone means that there's a relationship. 
having an intimate relationship with each other. The people of God aren't is not asked to come and memorize more information about God, like the laws, because it doesn't work. The covenant is deeper than that. We must know the Lord so well that we know how many sugars he takes in his coffee, or whether in fact he does drink coffee. We must know the Lord so well that he takes, pop, takes part, forms part of every millimeter of our being, that is part of every thought that we have, part of every moment in our lives, that everything we say or do flows from the relationship that we have with God. Verse 34 goes further and it says, I forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Forgiveness doesn't mean pretending that something didn't happen. Forgiveness is striving to sustain a relationship despite and in spite of what happened. Forgiveness is also not forgetting. We cannot simply forget. Our minds is not like a computer where we just delete some data and never think of it again. But when the Lord says he's not going to remember our sin, it means that he's not going to allow our sin to dominate or determine the relationship that we have with him or allow it to dictate our future. This is not a cheap grace that God is offering here, but rather a relationship that requires determination and work. Now from reading and understanding some of these new characteristics of the covenant, we see God as a healer, one who forgives, one who restores broken relationships, one who does that even though he is not the one in the wrong. Did you know that today is a special Sunday? It's the last Sunday of October, but it is also Reformation Sunday, which is a pretty huge deal in our church. But what is Reformation Sunday? It's the Sunday where we remember Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, which officially changed the church forever. Now, there were quite some theological issues that the reformers like the German Martin Luther, like the Swiss Ulrich Zwingli, like the Scotsman John Knox, like the Frenchman, John Calvin, there were quite a couple of issues that they had with the church at the time. Theological issues regarding how we understand God, how we understand salvation, the priesthood, the sacraments, grace. And there were a lot of things the church were doing at the time that they weren't happy with. And so from different parts of the world, at around the same time, voices of criticism rang out against the church. And the church did some terrible things to try and quiet those voices. But despite it all, the church re-looked at its dogma, re-examined some of its beliefs, and most importantly looked in earnest on how they understand God. And this led to the, to the formation of the Protestant churches. Now reading this reading from Jeremiah, on Reformation Sunday reminds us to celebrate the new things that God brings into our world even though at that time it may feel like to us like chaos and uncertainty. Whether it be the exile in biblical times or a theological debate that changed the church forever like in modern, early modern Europe or perhaps even in our time our place and in this congregation. It reminds us to appreciate the forgiveness and the grace that we, we receive day in and day out. Not a cheap grace, not a forgiveness that's false, but a forgiveness and a grace hard work. A forgiveness and a grace that in spite of our wrongdoings does not let us go. What is God bringing into your life 
into the life of this congregation that is new, even though it may feel like chaos. What were those moments in your life journey where you truly experienced God's grace and forgiveness? Where were those moments where you shared that same grace and forgiveness with others in your lives? God has been on a journey with his people from the time of Adam and Eve. God journeyed with them through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, through the time that the church started, established, and eventually until the Reformation came, and he still does, through all the ups and downs, all the highs and lows. God continues on the same journey with the church, with the different denominations, with our congregation, but also with each one of us. Because God comes to walk alongside us as he journeys with us. Sometimes he goes out in front of us. His love constantly surrounds us. He guides us. He chooses to forgive us. He chooses to heal and restore our relationship with Him. He chooses to help us. He chooses to include us in the new covenant so that we may know, just as the Reformation teaches, that we are saved by grace in Christ alone, based on the Scripture alone, by grace alone, for the glory of God alone. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, God of past, present and future, God who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, God of compassion, forgiveness and grace, we come to thank you. Thank you for who you are, thank you for what you mean to us, and thank you for what you do for us. As we journey through life, through all the ups and downs, all the mountain tops and valleys, you are with us. You go out ahead of us to show us the way. You are behind us to catch us if we stumble and fall. You walk beside us to keep us company. You walk with us to support us and love us. Thank you, Lord, that you are here and that we can experience the privilege of knowing you individually but also as a community. Thank you for the new things that you are creating in our lives and in the life of this church. Thank you for your forgiveness you offer us, for the relationship we get to have with you. Thank you that we can have your words written on our hearts. Lord, you know where we need some extra help. You know where we fall short. Move in us and among us so that we may know your will, that we may know what you expect from us and want from us, and so that we may do every, so that everything we do may flow from you, from our relationship with you. You know, Lord, what awaits us in this week to come. You know those things that we are worried about and nervous about. You know whether the week ahead is going to be just a normal week or whether it's going to be a good week or a bad week. You know who among us feel lost who among us is mourning, who among us are ill. You know who's writing exams and who's struggling with new aches and pains, and you know who needs you in a special way in this week to come. So walk with us and talk to us as we are pilgrims on this journey together. May everything we do this week be for your glory alone. Amen. We are now going to stand and sing together, Be Thou My Vision. Oh, 
ubabalo le nkosi yetu u Yesu Kristu utando luka tiko obutlalwana lo moyo o yenkwele malube nane nonke in the name of Christ, the Lord of God, and the Lord of the Holy Spirit, so with all of you will be and be. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us take hands as we sing a benediction over one another.